Workers Union of America. Thank you, President Langford. Thank you, Steve Van Sloden, John Duffy, Gary Refner, and thanks to all of you. And one of my good friends who's here from my local community where I grew up, Helen Olagi. Thank you all for taking the time and opportunity to allow me to come and speak to you. I just arrived from Washington, so I'm a little bit ahead of you because I'm three hours ahead. But uh, I just wanted to say to you how important it is for you to know that the House of Labor will be at the table when we have our discussions with the Department of Labor. And as your new Labor Secretary, I can tell you that our president feels very strongly that labor have a voice at the table. At every <laughs> mention too something about my background because I know I not all of you know much about that but I do want to tell you that as a, as a child growing up in a small town uh, maybe a company town you'd refer to parents in the area were all blue-collar workers uh, making a making a living some people were just making minimum wage and some people because they had union representation had had a better start they had protection in the workplace they had health care benefits, and they had a retirement. And my father uh, started out with the battery recycling plant out in the city of industry. And he helped to organize that unit. He brought the unit in, they brought the Teamsters in. No offense, I mean, we're all friends, we're all, we're all friends here. But um, he worked with them to help educate the workers, to talk to them about safety and protections. Because you know, battery recycling is one of the most hazardous industries in the country. And there are so few people that understand what that means. And I understand what that means because I remember my father lived through it. He's still alive, but barely. But I see the ramifications when you don't have worker safety. I see what happens when you don't have the appropriate clothing, safety guard, instruction, and technical help that you need when you're, when you're handling hazardous materials or equipment that you can become overwhelmed. And over years, if you're exposed to that over time and nothing happens to protect you, you can also impact your immediate family. Believe it or not, some of those contaminants go home. When your wife or yourself start washing your clothes out and you're not knowing that you should separate all that, that that shouldn't even be done, particles, lead, poisoning, and all that can contaminate the other clothing of your other family members. I didn't realize that until years later. But then I saw the slow deterioration of my father's health because he was exposed to lead poisoning. They found later that he had high levels of, of uh, lead in his, in his blood. He had to finally retire. And thank God at least he had the union there to protect him. That he still has that pension that he can rely on. All his medical treatment and everything that he needs is taken care of because that was made available through the union. So the middle, the middle class for me is a reality and something very real for so many working families. Families like mine and others that understand the value of having a member or members in your household that have a union card and the ability to organize. And that's something that I learned from my father years later when he'd come back and tell stories about he would, how he had to deal with management who didn't always understand that when they were fighting for additional increase in wages and benefits, it was really for our families was for us that they were fighting for and to keep that tradition going and to help other workers in the same <coughs> immediate area benefit from higher wages. My dad made a good salary, made a good salary, no doubt at that time, but now I can tell you that times have changed and it is harder for people to be represented by uh, collective bargaining agreements now. It's gotten tougher because we've been in different times, economic times that have been hard and we've had an administration in the past it wasn't as open. They did not want to somehow allow for the advantages of allowing people to organize, to be, to associate freely. So I understand that. And that's been a big part of my public life as an elected official in the state assembly where many of you from California, uh, from Southern Cal, uh, supported me and continue to support me when I was in the state senate. And we did some remarkable things. People told me, Hilda, you shouldn't be out there uh, asking for higher wages or increase in the minimum wage because you're going to hurt the very people that you're proclaiming you want to help. Well, that's a story you always get. Somehow you're going to hurt the people that you want to represent. And I'm saying, no, nothing could be further from the truth. Well, we, we got 
that clear. The AFL-CIO, our labor friends, interdenominational religious groups, community groups helped us pass the minimum wage in the state of California. Hadn't been raised in like seven years, from 425 to 575. That was so long ago. Now it's, now it's a bit higher, but we still have to get the federal minimum wage up higher as well. I think that's something that we need to work on. But more importantly, we need to bring the Department of Labor back into business so we can restore <laughs> division involved in making sure that people get their overtime, that they're paid their wages, that uh, Davis-Bacon and all these laws that have been passed for many, many years are implemented, and that we do an adequate accounting. We haven't been able to do that in the past eight years to get adequate surveys to make sure that people that are doing the kind of work that you do, that we have good data to show what the prevailing wages are, what the salaries are, and then come up with that and have that be a part of, of what uh, everyone should be able and capable of receiving. So we have a lot of work to do because now we have to beef up the department. For eight years, it's been on, an, on a downturn. We lost well over, I, I wanna say, maybe a thousand employees. Either they ran them to the ground, demoralized them, or people just left and said, I can't do my job. And, and I don't have to tell you because there's reports that you read about uh, the lack of enforcement in wage and hour and also in OSHA. And OSHA is a very important part of what the Department of Labor does. It protects you. It helps to, especially for those of you that are in hazardous, that can be hazardous environments. If, if you don't have someone there providing that protection, inspection, follow-up, and technical assistance. In all that, I can see now uh, a need to, to bring it back up again, at least to 2001 levels. And that's what this president has done. He has given us money through the American uh, reinvestment Recovery Act to put money back into the Department of Labor. So now at least we can put our, our uh, nameplate out in front of the door and say we're back in business, that we're going to be out there in the field, that we're going to be out there working next side by side with you, and expecting you to also call on us. We have 10 regional offices across this country, and we also deal in international issues, trade issues. I just got back from G8 Summit meeting where I met with other labor ministers, guess what, about labor, and about why America had not been out there in eight years. And I'm gonna fight to increase to see that we get more money in our budget so that I can have people in embassy offices around the, around the world. If we're negotiating with trade agree on trade agreements or revising them or expanding the components that are necessary to make sure that American workers as well as workers in other countries don't get disadvantaged, then we need to have staff. I don't have that staff right now, but I'm gonna be asking for that and I'm gonna want your help to back me up. Because I think, I understand there are some folks from Canada and from other parts of Europe that are here. I think you all understand the importance of what it is to work together. And, this, and we are in this together. This planet doesn't belong to the US, it doesn't belong to Europe, it doesn't belong to Latin America. It belongs to us and to your children and to your grandchildren. And we ought to be able to make sure that we leave something, that we leave something, but we also restore some integrity and trust in our economy in the United States. And part of that is by becoming uh, secure in our energy so that we can take care of ourselves and we don't necessarily have to rely on foreign, and I mean foreign countries that haven't been nice to us. We have a lot of good countries that have worked with us well, but let's face it, when there was the energy crisis and the gasoline was going up last year, I didn't count too many friends uh, from other parts of, of the world. And now we're saying we got to become energy independent. And we're talking about, and our president has talked about, putting at least five million people in new jobs, green jobs. Green, and, and when you think about it, green jobs are the very jobs that you're doing because you're saving us energy. You're either working in the, the renewable biofuels or wind or water, electric and gas, all those components qualify under my definition, or at least what I believe, is a green job. So believe me when I say that, that your industry <coughs> is going to be a prime, prime candidate for taking us and helping us get out of this recession. Because we're going to put